So hello everyone, we are group number two and we're going to present to you today our Happy Kids app. So uh, have you noticed that today every child above the age of 10 has their own smartphone, right? And smartphones can be a very useful tool for everyone. Like we all know that we really like our time management apps and also our GPS that allows us to visit some unfamiliar areas. Uh, but also, on the other end of things, we now know that smartphones can have an adverse effect on, on us. For example, uh, f we have some cases of misuse or, uh, more precisely, overuse of social apps. So, um, the important thing uh, for us as adults is that we should always be in control of this. Because we are aware of the consequences, and so we can decide for ourselves if the smartphone is going to be a useful tool, tool for us, or it's going to just uh, lead us to some sleep deprivation cycles or overuse of social media. So that's great for adults, but what about children? Considering everything I've told you now, uh, who here wants to know exactly what their child is doing on their smartphone and how much time he spends on it, right? So maybe those of you who are on the micromanagement side of things would like to know all this stuff. And some of you may be reluctant, uh, may, may find this overly invasive, okay? But we can all agree on one thing, that we want to know when something bad is happening, right? We want to know when there is actually some misuse, okay? For example, we have some alarming statistics that 20% of teens spend more than three hours on social media per day. And so this can really uh, mess up their vision of what things are important in life and what aren't. So um, we, uh, our app wants to, the goal of our app is to allow you to have a, a global vision of uh, whether everything is going great with your child. So for example, it wants to make predictions based on uh, app usage uh, from your child's phone, and also we incorporate uh, a sleep tracking, uh, sleep cycle tracking app in I'm featuring our app, so that we can detect immediately if a child doesn't sleep well at night, right? Um, and uh, the only problem with all this is that uh, all data connected to children, like it is very sensible data. We don't want to be able to sell your data to insurance companies, and most importantly, we don't want. Uh, your children to receive targeted ad advertisement for them because they are a lot more susceptible for, to this. So that's why we're going to use homomorphic encryption to make sure that everything we send on the cloud that, that uh, does this prediction for us will be encrypted. Okay. Um, so um, this is our privacy model. So our main goal is to keep uh, in data uh, private from the server, right? Uh, we're not very concerned with uh, whether the parent will have the raw data or not. Uh, the, the main idea is to have the parent uh, access to, that the parent has only access to the general assessment, right? He has an alert, like your child hasn't been sleeping for three days, or your child's been overusing social media or maybe at night and that's why he's not sleeping. But we don't want them generally to have like all the information, but this is not a cryptographic concern. If the parent wants to listen to the network and uh, get all this information, then that's, that's another problem. So um, another concern, uh, so thinking about this um, neural network model, uh, one challenge we had was how do we collect all this data accurately, right? So our idea was to start from some small model that's based on some statistics done by psychologists, and then maybe work in collaboration with parents who are willing to give us feedback uh, and uh, are willing to help us train the model, make more accurate uh, predictions, right? So um, the idea is to, from time to time, to send um, our model to the client's side, so to the parent's computer, and then have the parent answer some questions about how well we did predictions for the last week or something like that. The only concern uh, here was that maybe the server, when he receives the new model back, it can infer some data based on, based on uh, the difference between the previous model and the new one. So our idea was to not just send the model to one parent at a time, but to send it to a, basically a chain of parents. And then when we go through this chain, we get the model back, and so we cannot infer information for one client in, par in particular. So there are some uh, concerns like that. And um, I will uh, leave the others tell you about how 
uh, what are exactly are our features for uh, the demo that we prepared for you today. And uh, hopefully, this is all very scalable, so we hope to have a lot more features and a lot more, like, uh, more accurate predictions in the future. Okay. So let's talk about what features we use in our demo. So we know that uh, there should be a lot of features and there should be a lot of inputs from the social scientists or surveys. In this demo, we had what we thought was important and is feasible in two days. First, the app usage, we divide the apps into three classes, the social media, games, and education. And we also record the usage in three different time slots. Like if you use social media during school time a little bit, that's probably OK. A lot is not. But in the evening, you can use it more. But you should absolutely not be using it when you were supposed to sleep. Again, uh, the, another feature we use is sleep patterns. Uh, we record the hours of sleep. And timeliness means uh, the uh, parent can set a time that the kids should go to sleep by 10. If he goes to sleep at 12, uh, we will record a delay of two hours. Even if he goes to sleep earlier, we will record a sleep uh, d uh, like delay of minus one. Because sometimes uh, sleeping too much may be a sign of depression. And maybe one day of uh, sleep irregularity is not a big concern, so we record it for three days. So we have six features here. And together, we have 15 elements in the feature. And the score, again, it should come from the social scientists uh, or based on parent feedback. For this demo, we used our best judgment on uh, with how to decide the scores. Another thing is this score does not tell you why your kid is getting a low score. Like it may be for excessive social media or maybe for lack of a sleep. Uh, in the actual model, we can have, instead of one score, we can have different scores. Or we can use one of the explainable AI models or a combination of both. This is the model that uh, we built. It has two fully connected layers. It's good enough to predict the data set that we created. And we use the squared activation function because, uh, as Kim was saying, uh, this is good enough for uh, models that are not too deep and also very easy to implement uh, in uh, SIL. For now, we train it on plain text. But as Monica was explaining, we have plans on how we can train it on encrypted data. But the inference is actually done on using homomorphic encryption using the SEAL library. And Ben is going to talk about it. All right, so we did an implementation of the machine learning aspect in SEAL. Um, so the first layer um, is plain text um, matrix vector multiplication done on the server with the feature vector. And the second step is this uh, square in place. And the third step would be to do this final uh, layer, which is another plain text um, inner product. Okay, so we have a full implementation of this in SEAL. We used CKKS, which has a multiplicative depth of three for our circuit. We relinearize and scale after each multiplication. For the uh, multiplication of the matrix with the um, feature vector, we use the diagonalization uh, method. And in particular, we based it on the code that um, Hao showed us earlier in the week for doing this. Um, for the square in place, we just used the, the features uh, built into SEAL. And then we did the inner product um, using the technique that Kim showed us for being able to use a O of log n rotations. Okay. And then the final result um, would still be encrypted. And we would simp it's a score. And we're just going to send the score to the parent's device. And then they can decrypt it. And there can be some logic locally on the device to see is the score high, medium, or low to you know, determine what type, of, um, what type of notification to send the parent. Um, so we did implement it here in SEAL. Um, the parameters that we went with was uh, 2 to the 14 for our dimension and our scale of 40. So we had uh, sort of three scales here. Um, we went with this uh, larger parameter set um, for now. Uh, we did try 30 here, but we noticed a, sort of a decrease in precision. So um, for now, we were kind of sticking with um, these parameters. Um, 
our ciphertext size is about uh, one megabyte, and our Galois keys are 170 megabytes, but we haven't done any optimization to the Galois keys. So we anticipate there could be some, you know, um, factor that could be shaved off there. Um, we timed how much time it takes to compute the homomorphic circuit on the server, and we um, timed it at uh, 477 milliseconds, which um, certainly seems um, very doable. And, uh, and as mentioned earlier, our feature vector to begin with is um, 15 length, but the way that the batched encoding is being done here in SEAL, um, this is scalable to having a feature vector of you know, length several thousand. If in later you know, iterations it were you know, deemed necessary to include more data in this feature vector. Okay? But for now we have a feature vector of 15. Um, here you can see the, on the final line here of the uh, screenshot the expected uh, result and the precision that is um, given to us by CKKS. Right, so just to wrap up a little bit here, we're very excited to present what we believe is the first um, privacy preserving uh, parental tracking app that allows parents, that specifically focuses on allowing parents to monitor their child's mental health. Um, we're confident that this is sound. We've taken steps both cryptographically and non cryptographically to maintain careful access control of the child's health data so that the server does never sees any health data and the parent only sees a reasonable amount. Um, we're confident that this is feasible. We've built a prototype and it already runs and we've found several ways that we can scale it efficiently in the future. Um, and of course, we're very excited about the impact of this app. We think it will improve outcomes for children, allowing their parents to be more in tune with their mental health and still protect their health data. So thank you and we will take questions now. So first question is nothing related to cryptography. Uh, what if the kids just turn off the phone yeah. or buy a new phone? <laughs> That's a good question. Kids could do that. Yeah. Has this worked for anyone? I mean, uh, I, I've heard that it has, but is it, uh, is it uh, uh, well, real to say that every parent can make the, their children do this because they're not doing this at, at this particular moment? They all have their smartphones. So uh, my suggestion would be like maybe you can implement another method to mm -hmm. align with the real activity of their using their phone. For, for example, if you see your kid is using the phone a lot, but somehow the data shows differently, uh, there should be a way to uh, like file a claim or try to detect that kind of behavior. Oh, you mean if the if the child finds a way to go around the uh, the app? Yeah, yeah that, that's a real a concern. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> especially knowing kids today, they're very tech uh, savvy. So, yeah, we should definitely do this thing. <laughs> so, how can you enforce the this uh, game app to provide some playing time data or some other data? Because um, I think it's kind of difficult to extract such a data from some um, display data or other features. You mean to extract it from the app or to extract some information based uh, on it? Because what we have now is like just the length of uh, use in a day. So that's pretty easy to do on a smartphone, but yeah. yeah. Um, there are also, there are already tracking apps that can monitor your social media and other app usage. Um, the ones I've seen are typically geared towards adults who want to have a better sense of how much phone usage they have, but um, I think we could use those same features to monitor children's phones. So probably they, they may try to find some game application which is not classified as a game. <laughs> <laughs> That's possible. Actually, our idea is the classification will, down, done by, will be done by the server and it will send its own app that classify this app as this. Not by the phone itself, or not by Play Store. Uh, so I have two questions. Um, so it seemed like the model that you were describing, where you have kind of nine uh, features, um, three types of apps, three types of day, all that, that you, uh, this is actually a novel model that you're proposing, or did you get a model from the literature and you're just kind of modifying it? No, we came up with it, actually. Mm -hmm. And we actually tried to find data that at, at least resembles this so that we could actually use actual data. But most of the database that we could get 
had aggregated uh, data like this many hours of a smartphone usage or maybe the kid is using it for his studies and they don't know or total this many hours in 24 hours not when he's sleeping or not when he's in school Just one more comment on that. Uh, we did look at a study where they were using machine learning to study sort of uh, phone data based on like college students, but it was mainly based on like screen time off, screen time on, sleep data. So we didn't come across a study that particularly used machine learning on, you know, the app usage itself. But, you know, with some more look, there may be something out there. Uh, so um, very... Uh Brief question, uh, similar to one of the questions in the other demos. I wasn't quite sure why you picked um, n was 2 to the 14. It seems to me like you have a really small feature vector and only depth 3. So I was wondering, like, do you need a really large amount of precision? Or what, what was the reason for such a large n? No, I think it was because we had to do the three uh, multiplications that forced us up. And the fact that we're using the, the batched encoding instead of 15 separate ciphertexts. Um, yeah, we could look into some other ways to optimize that. But I suspect you could use a smaller N. OK. Um, and then third comment is just that, as with some of the other presentations, if you do stray into the kind of retraining um, domain, uh, providing data back for training, you're always just going to face this issue of, um, you know, how do you trust the data that the people are uploading and what are the incentives, that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we were actually thinking about this, but we didn't have time to mention it uh, in the presentation, and we also had a discussion uh, with you about this, that uh, we can have a, a set of data on the server that we already know the answer to, the, the, the training data that we use, and once we get the, the model back to the server, uh, we can just try it on these uh, values and see if it's completely out, uh, out of bounds or if it's uh, still accurate, as accurate or more accurate than before. That's the idea. You know, a possible another consideration in this use case, we wouldn't really anticipate the model having to change very rapidly, as in like a spam adversarial setting. Um, we could update the list of apps which are considered games, but that happens in the futurization step. Um, so once this model has been established, you know, we think that probably it's not going to need to be incredibly dynamic. So you could do some, you know, perhaps large user studies. Um, perhaps in collaboration with schools who have, you know, iPad programs or, or others who might have an interest in offering this service or collaborating on this type of data project. 